Stefan Mückstein from Energy Lab. Uh, today's video uh, will be about uh, solar module cleaning in the Middle East and North Africa and why it matters so much for this region and what the different solutions are. Um, for today's uh, call, I'm being joined by George Eidelhuber um, from Jeddah in Saudi, and he's the CEO and founder of Normart. Uh, robotic uh, solar module cleaning company. Thanks for joining us, George. Pleasure um, to be here. Great. Uh, can you briefly introduce yourself and uh, your company, Normat? Certainly. And thanks for having us today, Stefan. Uh, and thank you for saying my last name right. It's much appreciated and very uncommon. Uh, so Nomad Desert Solar Solutions uh, is a company based out of Saudi Arabia. We were founded in 2012. Uh, in conjunction with King Abdullah University of Science and Technology. Uh, we're a research institute looking into some of the key problems facing clean energy and other key research areas. And one of the research areas my team and I were focusing on was, was dust on the solar panels. So we formed technologies around solutions for this problem for solar panels well before a market was really thought of for solar energy in the Middle East. And then as the market has now exploded, come online, Dust is the major problem we see facing a lot of these uh, desert arrays. So Nomad is here to address that problem. Okay. Um, why did you choose to set up uh, Nomad in Saudi? You're originally from Australia. Certainly. Uh, before I came to Saudi Arabia in 2009, I really had no idea of the region, uh, either culturally, economically, or indeed the opportunity for, for solar in the region. Uh, there just weren't any large-scale solar arrays here. I was originally uh, part of the university staff group here. And so really, as an engineer and an entrepreneur looking for interesting challenges uh, to solve in the region while I was here, this one presented itself. And it was really too good a problem to leave unattended, essentially. So yeah. with all of the support uh, locally for uh, technology startups and spin-outs of these kind of things, uh, Saudi Arabia has been actually a fantastic place to found and, and develop a company. Excellent. And um, what what does NOMAD stand for? I, I, th I understand it's an acronym, right? That's right. Uh, so we wanted to capture the spirit of the uh, device itself and the company's philosophy in this name. The, the name is actually an, an acronym for No Water Mechanical Automated Dusting Device. Uh, this came about because through all of the research and development we did, it was clear that any long-term large-scale solutions would have to be waterless and fully automated. The, the conditions here are unbelievably harsh for humans to be working in these environments. And so we wanted to capture the essence of the nomadic peoples that are really uh, moving through these harsh desert conditions, taking, taking the minimum of what they need and being able to handle uh, these conditions better than anyone else on Earth. I like that. That's very nice. Um, we've touched on already the soiling and, and the dust being a serious issue, especially in the Middle East and uh, North Africa. Um, can you elaborate why this is such a big topic in this region? Certainly. I mean, the conditions we've seen here, and there's a lot of research now done in the last decade or so on, on the soiling conditions, specifically in the Middle East. There are some other environments around the earth, uh, for example, the Atacama Desert in Chile, some regions in Australia, but really here in the Middle East, we have this incredible combination of, of fine particle dust, humid environments and incredible temperatures. And what we see is the dust is sort of picked up by the morning wind and placed on fairly moist solar panels that have been uh, wetted by the humidity from the night before. The sun comes up, bakes the whole thing solid. And unless you're taking that off on a very regular basis, this can massively impact the yield of your large-scale solar arrays. And it's a very difficult problem to solve, uh, Stefan. A lot of people have worked with things like uh, uh, electrostatic repulsion forces or coatings and things like this. And in many parts of the world, it's not that big an issue. It rains often enough to clean the panels effectively. It's not something that really has to be worried about. Here, it's, it's a day-to-day -day issue. Uh, which really challenges the, the, the whole operation of, of solar at any sort of scale in the Middle East. And it's really the ideal problem to, to address to ensure the continuity of this large-scale solar deployment we're seeing. Right. Yeah. And so basically, 
we're saying that this region, the, the Middle East, um, North Africa, and, and maybe some other desert areas are, are different to the US, Europe, um, most parts of China. So basically not desert areas. Um, exactly. An example uh, of that would be the fact that, I mean, the worst case scenario we measured, but it's, it's, it's indicative. Uh, dust storm events, for example. We had a dust storm event at our test field here at Kaust where we measured a 60% reduction in the output of the solar panels after a two hour event. And that was a pretty horrendous event, let's be clear. There was, uh, it was sort of raining and dusting at the same time and the, the pristine field was utterly covered in a tiny space of time. But we're seeing on average between 0.4 and 1.1% per day drop in output, a, a seasonal variation and locational variation. And this can extend uh, many percentage points if arrays are left for weeks, and even more if it's left for months. Nowhere else on earth really has this kind of impact uh, that we see here. Wow. Um, in our last conversation, you actually mentioned that you're currently doing a, or did a testing between manual cleaning and robotic cleaning. Um, and the results were quite positive. Um, can you talk a little bit on that? Certainly. Uh, a lot of people would think that uh, a cost-effective approach would be manual cleaning. So you send out teams of workers, you give them squeegees and you tell them to go for it. Uh, we've seen how even at very low labor costs in the region, that just is really uneconomical and, and very hazardous and very difficult to, to uh, complete. Nevertheless, if you have someone there manually cleaning the panels, you can get a very nice finish on those panels. You know, like, like if you're cleaning the, the, the windows by hand. So yeah. what we've always endeavored to do is uh, replicate those manual cleaning levels of cleanliness with a robotic solution. And this has been ongoing research and development over years. And recently we partnered with uh, several third parties for doing tests on seeing the efficacy of the automated cleaning. And we compare that to a daily manual cleaning uh, and compare a daily automated cleaning. And then we might leave the panels on a third uh, array that's being measured for a week or a month or even longer. Uh, results just came back recently from uh, a third party test, which will be published shortly. And what we've seen, thankfully, is that uh, the Nomad automated daily cleaning is within about 1% or the margin of error, less than 1% most of the time of the manual based cleaning. Uh, within the sort of the day to day noise of when the dust has been deposited, local wind conditions and things like that. When we compared that to a, an array right next door to that one that had not been cleaned, we're seeing significant drops over time, uh, many percentage points of reduction in essentially a linear drop over several weeks. So this has validated not only the uh, the need for good cleaning methodologies for large scale and any solar really, but also uh, for us, it's just demonstrated the value of our robot itself to effectively clean the panels. Amazing. So that brings me actually to the next point. Um, so what I've done here is uh, build a little bit of a matrix where I'm comparing the size of different uh, solar installations. So from a very small one, um, maybe residential size, to a medium-sized industrial commercial uh, uh, size, which is uh, 200 uh, kilowatt peak to 20 megawatt peak. So that would already be a large uh, industrial commercial, I guess, to a utility scale. And then um, comparing the different cleaning solution from manual cleaning to robotic cleaning wet and to then robotic cleaning dry. And obviously, we're looking at this now specifically for this uh, region again, Middle East, uh, North Africa, where you, you have a very dry climate, uh, but with a lot of dust accumulation. Um, where would you sort of, uh, if, I, if I try to place now the tick marks and the crosses, so for the small size, which solution would you recommend for the small size solar installation? Is it manual, wet cleaning, dry cleaning with robots? That's a good question. And uh, that's also uh, a, a nice matrix you have. So usually with very small applications, residential applications, uh, manual cleaning is often the only economical way 
to really clean those panels. So the challenge you have with using any sort of robotic cleaning with a very small uh, arrays is obviously the cost benefit ratio over time. And with the low costs of energy now, we're seeing historically low uh, energy values for solar, which is fantastic. You know, it's now one of the world's, uh, if not the world's cheapest energy source. We can't really afford to use robots on very small arrays. So as you have said, wet and dry robotic cleaning are generally out. Very good. So and, and, exactly, and, and it's the, the cost um, of these robots um, for these small sizes just are, are not economical, right? That's, that's generally the way. You have an interesting uh, confounding factor there though, is if these very small arrays are on rooftops, for example, residential rooftops, quite often rooftop access is not an easy proposition. And so how to keep these very small scale arrays clean on a regular basis safely is, is actually a, a very significant question that uh, the industry, I think, is trying to work out an answer to. But it really isn't easy. And we're seeing also a preponderance towards uh, larger, easier to manage arrays. You have here the commercial uh, array size, for example. So rather than small uh, arrays on individual rooftops of people's houses, we might put a large array on top of a factory, for example. And anyway, is obviously what the industry leader uh, in the Middle East for this kind of deployment. And we're, we're very happy to have worked with you on some of these fantastic projects where we have nice, long, regular rows on nice, regular rooftops. So this is a good opportunity to use robotic cleaning because quite often manual cleaners on these rooftops, access is very difficult. You don't want to disrupt whatever's happening in the factory. Uh, there might be security concerns. There's definitely safety concerns. So this is an example where robotic cleaning definitely is a good idea. And then in terms of uh, wet versus dry, dry cleaning, we've seen on rooftops, we can get it to within uh, a percentage point or two of, of, of optimal clean. You don't really need uh, wet robotic cleaning for rooftops as a general rule. We see as well from our clients that they don't want from an environmental point of view to, because sweet water is quite scarce here in these regions, right? Uh, to use yes. water for cleaning of the roofs. Uh, and, and getting the water to the roofs is an uh, additional challenge. Typically, you're more of an expert there, but correct me if I'm wrong, all the wet robotic cleaning solutions that I typically see with people supervising them still, uh, usually at least, uh, where someone moves the hose or moves the robot, I, I think they don't seem to be quite as autonomous as the dry cleaning robots. You've touched on some really, really good points and very important points. And these also apply to your, your third column with the utility size uh, arrays. You know, what we see is the best, most water efficient, water-based robotic cleaning systems are using at least a cup of water per panel. It doesn't sound like too much, but when you consider that some of these utility scale arrays have millions of panels, uh, you know, that there were millions of panel cleanings in a, in a, in a short space of time, suddenly the amount of fresh water you have to be pouring onto your array is enormous. And there's all sorts of interesting and difficult challenges associated with that. So we'll get to that one in a second. The next obviously is the environmental concern with getting water to site, wasting the water. It's the most precious resource we have here in the region. And then all of the additional hassles of cables and hoses and things to get the water to the robot itself is also a, a major challenge. So we're seeing uh, dry robotic cleaning is really the way the industry is moving now for these utility scale projects as a general rule. How do we keep our array clean without using our most precious resource? This is essential. And we could go into further detail on this, some of the technical issues with using water. For example, you actually have to deionize the water, otherwise you get scale. You can get thermal shock happening if you've got very hot panels. These panels get enormously hot in this very high temperature. If you go splashing a bucket of cold water on that, you get a very instantaneous thermal shock loading. So preheating the water and, and ensuring that, uh, there's just a lot to think of basically. If you can move to a point where water is no longer required, You've massively simplified your entire cleaning process. If now a, a client would approach you or thinks about robotic cleaning, what are sort of the typical things that they should think about in selecting a cleaning robot solution? 
That's a great question, Stefan. And there's quite a few very, very important points, obviously. What we're talking about is uh, an investment in material and machinery and equipment that you want to pay dividends over lifetimes of the project. So most solar arrays are really, we're looking at around a 20 year plus life cycle expectancy. So you need to be thinking about how will I keep my array clean in this environment every day for 20 years. So really the first point you really want to look for, I think, is reliability. You need to know that the robots will be there for you every day and cleaning and not causing you troubles, not stopping working, and then you start to lose your bottom line on lost energy that you didn't harvest. So reliability is really, a, really a key point. The next one is that you really want to be able to keep an eye on your robots at a distance. These fields are enormous for utility scale. And without a proper communications protocol, you might have robots doing things or not doing anything that you had no idea about until late in the piece. You have to consider as well with the safety aspect of that, if you have robots that just stop dead on your panels themselves, partial shading of the panel can cause damage to those panels. And that's another point you have to really consider the reliability of these systems. So reliability and monitoring are two of the key points. And there's several others. Obviously, you want to make sure that there's no damage to the panels while the robot is cleaning them. We're seeing some very interesting choices of brush material, shall we say, on some of these robots that are coming up that are very abrasive. Now, the abrasive aspect might not show itself for a number of years even. So long-term abrasion testing is one of the things you should really look for in a robot. Have they really tested these robots' abrasive aspects on the panels in real-world conditions for a number of years because there's no standards out yet for this kind of thing? We're working on these standards, but they haven't really come yet. So. Owners have got to be considering the safety of the panels over the lifetime of the array. There's a number of other different examples of things that really have to be brought into consideration. If I may continue, one of the other very important points is that quite often the layout and design of these arrays is often done so in a way to optimize certain situations. For example, we want to minimize the amount of cabling that we use on these arrays. So we, from a bird's eye view, will lay this array out in a certain way. We want road access, and these are the drivers to the layouts of these arrays. What we're seeing now is a realization that sometimes the layout doesn't allow for proper cleaning. And what that means is you might have saved a bit here and there on some of these things, but you're left with an array that for the next 20 years might be incredibly difficult to clean. So we're working closely with our clients from the design stage onwards with all manner from commercial to utility scale arrays to make sure that they're cleanable long term, which means nice, long, regular rows as much as possible and integrate that sort of design thinking with the rest of the things to be optimized. It's a broad cross-section of ideas. There's plenty more, of course, but these are some of the key points you should consider. And uh, how do you compare, you feel that Norma compares to, to its competition, in, especially to the points that you mentioned so far. I suspect most of the cleaning robots actually are targeting the, the European or North American market, cleaning robots designed maybe in China and in other countries. How do you compare on these criteria that you just mentioned? It's obviously difficult to keep the bias out of the answers, but I'll do my best. So I think uh, your point about the country of origin of the other robots plays an essential role because without the deep understanding of the local conditions and these local conditions driving the entire development process for the robot, quite often robots will be built in labs far away that don't understand the real challenges long-term that these robots are going to face. So definitely in terms of the fact that Nomad's entire pedigree, its entire development process was in the real desert conditions in which we now have our major markets. This is a key differentiator and really having had years and years of development time and testing time in these desert conditions themselves really I think sets our design apart from the rest. We've made the mistakes, we've gone through those design iterations, we've had those challenges and those failures and those revisions and those reviews in these conditions and that's all been built into the deep knowledge we have of how to solve this problem most effectively. What we've ended up then with we believe is the optimized cleaning methodology for these conditions. Nomad is born and raised in the desert. George, a question for the end customer. What is the business case? Do you have some numbers that what makes sort of sense for customers to think about the payback time, internal rate of return, or is this unique from project to project? Do you have some guidance on that? 
Sure. Obviously, for every project is different. And so many of the factors of, of how a project is designed from the ground up are going to impact the, the overall financial situation. The main driver of cost for an end user is going to be if they're purchasing the robots. It's going to be how many robots do I need per megawatt to effectively clean my array? Do I need to clean them daily or can I get away with cleaning them weekly? And if I can clean them weekly, can I move robots between rows, for example, manually to try to squeeze more out of each robot? And that introduces factors of cost around operation and maintenance, handling, people, people dropping things, all sorts of different aspects of, do we already have people on site we can leverage, for example. There, there's so many calculations that go into it. So what we really try to do with our customers is we, we sit down and we analyze the size of the project, the location. We see if there's any data out there already for this area on how dirty things are gonna get, how fast. We can use that and the anticipated cost of the energy or the value of the energy that they're producing to work out how valuable is it to clean their array how often, and it's an optimization process generally for that sort of thing. What we find though, is that anything on a rooftop with rows over around the 100 meter mark, we start to get very attractive rates of return for deploying robots on a purely energy saved and labor cost saved approach. When you start to factor in soft values like the increased safety and all of these other things, it's basically we've found a no brainer. When we're looking at utility scale projects though, we're seeing a massive larger project, much tighter margins on things like cleaning, and also different factors coming in, like people being on site, training of operators, things like this. It is a very complex calculation, but it is a finite calculation and we can work together to build out a good estimate. Uh, we hope to pay back the customer's uh, initial investment in a couple of years, generally, depending on the layout. Um, you mentioned a couple of things about the design, intra row movement of robots for industrial commercial clients. So if the end clients, probably these things, they are not experts on mm -hmm. these topics. Who are you typically then engaging with? I, I know obviously we have worked together as part of Enaware. Is that the EPC and O&M company typically your point of contact or is it the end client? How does that work? It varies from case to case. Quite often, let's say factory roof owners don't really want to have to make decisions about complex nitty gritty they maybe don't understand and don't want to have to understand. So what we appreciate that very much, they shouldn't have to worry about this kind of thing. So what we try and do is provide a product and a service to those who the owner is going to trust to look after this project once it's deployed and the ones who are putting the project in from the get go. I have to say working with Enoware has been a pleasure in this regard because Enoware's team from every stage of the process from the deployment the initial consultation through the deployment process, through the operation and maintenance process. It's much easier for someone like us to work uh, with, with anywhere as an intermediary, a trusted intermediary with the end user. The end user knows that they're getting the right deal through the intermediary, the EPC generally. And so that simplifies everyone's expectations and, and requirements. Ultimately, the end users would like a product that they don't have to worry about that produces value for them uh, in the long term. And that's really the ethos that we try to provide. In terms of evolution of your product, you're still a relatively young company. Um, as we just discussed, it is important to have experts working on this from an O&M and EPC point of view. The robots are not a plug and play that you can just plug and play on, on any uh, solar rooftop without considering the, the actual design of the rooftop. Where do you see the evolution? Are you at an early stage or are you already at a relatively late stage of the evolution? Is there still going to be a lot of technological advances? So we're looking now at expanding our core technologies to different market segments. We've had quite a long time, we're talking years now, to develop and optimize the communications platform, electromechanical platform, for example. And now it's all about utility and use case and optimizing it for all of these different market segments. So what we have now in terms of the rooftop product, the Nomad rooftop robot, we've essentially optimized that down now. So it should be as close to plug and play with an end user as possible with a minimum number of constraints that we put on the EPC, the design of the array. We have a, a standard layout to say, provided that you are within these tolerances for your rows, the robot will drop on and here you can run it on your mobile phone, basically. So that seems to 
to be at a mature stage of development. We've obviously had a lot of experience and practice now with that, and we're comfortable with this product uh, lasting well into the future. In fact, with you guys at the Master Baker site in Dubai, uh, this robot has now been in operation on that roof, I'd say coming on two years, possibly more by now. So I think this is one of the longest running rooftop robotic deployments, and we're seeing a lot of uh, value out of that, and we're seeing a lot of the technologies we've deployed there showing their longevity. And so we're happy to be moving that into these other deployments around the region. With all the learning from that and all of the, the process with that, always getting fed back into the, the core product. So then we've taken that, that's the rooftop segment. We're then talking about the larger utility scale segments. And now this is where it's all to do with how are the panels mounted in these massive arrays. We have now, our oldest serving product is the fixed tilt robot system, which is fantastic for any like long range fixed tilt arrays. And we're now very proud to be announcing shortly some significant developments when it comes to the, the core robotic design, but now fully tracker compatible as well. So we're at the stage now where we're beginning our rollout with early adopting customers for uh, pilots of our new uh, tracker technology. And we really think this is world beating technology. We're very excited about what it promises. Excellent. Thank you so much watch this has been amazing thanks for all the information and sharing this knowledge if the viewers like the video please press the like button and subscribe and if you have any questions um, we'll provide the link to norma um, in the descriptions you can also add comments and we'll try to get back to you thanks thanks so much Kevin. Thanks.